a lot of bits and bobs and different things in the wider Zen ecosystem. And during the past few months, I've been mostly working on the hypervisor itself. And this is the reason that I come here to talk about this topic today. Uh, so the topic today is towards a configurable and slimmer x86 hypervisor. Uh, we only have 30 minutes, so, uh, and uh, so I'm going to assume that people know the, the internal of Zen to a certain degree. Uh, but uh, if you find anything that's unclear to you, just feel free to interrupt or ask questions afterward. Uh, so let's go straight into the talk. So as far as the x86 Zen is concerned, there are three major virtualization mode. So the first one is the PB mode. So this mode is the oldest of all three. Uh, it came from an era that uh, in which the hardware virtualization extension didn't exist. So, and needless to say, this mode has given Zen a head start in the cloud computing era, and it's it was rather important. However, it's aging at the moment, uh, and it has been, I mean, it has become a source of security <coughs> bugs recently, and uh, it has certainly caused frictions among communities, different communities like Zen community, communities and the Linux kernel community. Uh, however, it, this mode it is in, in itself still rather useful because uh, it's rather efficient to run unikernel and nested virtualization without VVMX or VSVM support. <coughs> and the second mode is HVM mode. Uh, this mode is made possible by the introduction of hardware virtualization extension. It requires QEMU to do certain emulation and it has become the mainstream Zen VM mode recently. Oh. And the third mode is the PVH mode. This mode is essentially HVM without QEMU. It's still under development at the moment, but the uh, guest ABI has been declared stable in 4.8 release, 4.8 release, so you can actually st start porting your guest operating system to this mode now. Uh, it is expected to be the most performant and secure mode of all three uh, because if you use as, as much hardware support as possible and shed as much emulation as possible, uh, we do hope it will become the major mode soon, but uh, it, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, so coming back to our topic that uh, an x86 sand that is configurable and uh, slimmer. So this project, you know, this topic actually involves two rather big projects. And to be honest, uh, my original intent was to do the second. But as I went through the Zen code base, I discovered there's a lot of things, other cleanups or whatever things to do, and that part has grown into a pro useful project in its own right. So that's the first project. So the first project is to split PV and HVM code from within the x86 hypervisor. And this project aims to refactor the x86 hypervisor code to make the guest supporting code guarded by two options in the k-config. And the second project is the PV ABI in, in PVH container. Basically, it is to implement a PV ABI shim and then use it to translate PV hypercore into PVH once where necessary. Uh, I will go into these projects one by one. So the first, uh, for the first project, splitting PV and HVM code. So why do we want to do that? So we want this project so that users can pick and choose the guest interfaces they want 
and this can lead to a smaller Zen binary, smaller memory footprint. And because a whole set of guest interfaces, so if, say, suppose you configure uh, disable one set of guest interfaces, they are not available to, to be used by the guest anymore. So we also reduce the attach service. And uh, in the case that if PV is disabled, we also reclaim a lot of pressures address space so that we can uh, less than support more than 16 terabyte host memory more easily. It is not that it does, Zen doesn't support that today, but with uh, P, uh, when PV is, is, is disabled, this can be achieved easily, more easily. And along the way, I also want to improve the x86 hypervisor code base. And because Zen was started like, uh, how is it, 15, 14 years ago, and uh, there's a lot to be designed in the code base. And it's also important to point out, this project does not aim to kill PV in the hypervisor, because as said before, PV mode is still useful in certain cases like unikernel or nested virtualization without the uh, virtualized VMX or SVM support. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the picture showing the memory layout of Zen running an X, uh, PV guest. So as you can see, on the left-hand side, at least two huge trunks of address space are reserved for the PVABI. And this picture is not up to scale. So actually, Zen only gets about eight terabyte of address space to work with. So if we disable PV in the hypervisor, we can then reclaim all the address space marked in red on the right-hand side. Uh, so all these sections add up to, if my math, if I'm, my calculation is correct, they add up to more than 256 terabyte. So, well, that should be good enough for quite some time. And here is the conceptual map of the x86 code. We have several components, several bit components for the x86 hypervisor. The first is the common code. The common code is things like uh, all the common infrastructures, core infrastructures like uh, grant table, event channel, uh, and the uh, taslet, taslet or whatever common code shared between various architectures. And the second component is the x86 platform specific code, so like the early boot code or the uh, trap exception handling or x86 specific domain handling code. And the third and fourth components are all the guest supporting code like supporting different guest types. Uh, ideally, all these components should be linked together by several sets of well-defined interfaces. Um, but however, in reality, the situation is a bit different. So this is the reality. We still have the interfaces between common code and x86 code, well, we have to have that because Zen also support other architectures. There used to be an IA64 port, but it's dead now, and, but now we also have the ARM port. So there has to be some sort of well-defined interfaces between the common code and the platform-specific code. But then, for the rest of it, the boundaries are not really clear. And it's not really surprising because at the early days, Zen was designed as an operating system for operating system. And 
when there wasn't really HPM support, there isn't really there wasn't really much to do. So the original Zen code was mostly like x plus some PV or the PV supporting code, all in one place. And then later, HVM came along. So the developers did the quick, I mean, basically botch all the HVM code on top of the existing code. And that would be because that, that was obviously the quickest way to get HVM support in Zen. So yeah. The, the code works today, but still, there, there's a lot of room for improvement, let's say. So here's the, a taste of what the current code looks like. So in this function, do foo for the guest, for x six guest. So there's some code, initialize whatever, blah, 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 and common code, and then all of a sudden there's a check. Oh, if this is the HVM guest, so let's call this other function instead and then return to the caller. And then the rest of the, rest of the do foo function is just filled with a lot of other code that does this thing for a PV guest. And here's another example. In this do bar function, uh, it, is, it is literally littered with a lot of checks. It's like if this is a HGM guest, let's do something. If this is a PV guest, let's do something else. And then in between, and then there's a lot of code for common cases and then some other checks. If this is a HGM guest, let's do this. If, if this is PV guest, then do that. So it's really hard to follow the logic so what we would like to do for the future code is uh, basically to refactor all these two cases into something like this. So we have a function to do something for the guest, and this function should contain the code for the common case, and then call the respective handler for the different guest types. So I think this way is a lot cleaner than the previous two forms. Uh, so here's the game plan. It's a rather big and sometimes a bit tedious project. So I've, I've, deci I mean, I've designed a multi-stage plan for this project. So the first stage is to identify all the components that need refactoring. I mean, so far I've identified quite a few. Uh, the DOM0 builder, which is responsible for building DOM0. So Roger added the PVH DOM0 building code some time ago. So there's actually two DOM0 builders in Zen. And then there's the domain handling code to handle x86 specific aspects for a domain. Uh, so, and that file was like uh, a few thousand lines of code mixed together for these different guest types. And then there's trap handling code and guest, uh, and then there's memory management code and guest memory accessors and so on and so forth. And this is certainly a incomplete list, and it's likely going to get longer and longer as, it, as I dig deeper and deeper. And then the second phase is to do the coerced grain refactoring. This is going to be done mostly for the PV code. Uh, it's not re very hard, so at this stage, I need to move code around, basically to move the code from the common x86 code down to a PV specific directory. And also in the process of doing so, I've also split all the code into manage mode trunks. So, so far I think I've split at least 
some of the uh, emulation code into their own files that greatly reduce the, the individual file size. And it's definitely more manageable, manageable and understandable at this point. And then while I'm doing all this, I'll also do some basic cleanups, say like to use better function names and do better coding styles. And then the next stage is going to be fine grain refactoring. And this is going to be done for both PB and HVM code. Basically, this stage aims to abstract out a set of guest interfaces. Uh, so let's go back to the here. Basically, that stage, we need to get these two. And then in the process of doing so, we need to adjust the interfaces between components if necessary. And we are really likely to fix some x86 common code as well, because some, as far as I can tell, some of the code is written with assumptions that aren't true or needed anymore today, but we'll see. And then finally, we'll make PV and HVM configurable by kconfig. Okay, that's the first big project. And here's the second project, the PV ABI in PVH container. So why? So there are two main selling points. The first is that we can continue to support PV in a more secure manner because after moving the PV ABI into a PVH container, uh, then, I mean, there won't be any PV uh, or the guests won't be able to make PV hypercore into the Zen anymore. So any bug in the PV hypercore code is going to be contained within the guest context. So any bug in that area is not going to be as severe as it is now. The second selling point is that we can then have more than 128 gigabyte worth of 32-bit PV guest on the host. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but uh, this is in relation to the PV guest API, because some portion of the PV address space is shared by all the 32-bit PV guests, and that's the size of that portion is 128 gigabyte. After we move the PV ABI into a PVH container, so each 32-bit PV guest can have their own 128 gigabyte address space to work with. So that's why we can now have more than 128 gigabyte worth of 32-bit PV guests on the host. So here's a picture demonstrating the basic idea of this project. Uh, so we are going to create a component called PV Shim. We're going to load it into ring zero into, uh, in the PVH container. And then we load the PV kernel to ring one as usual. The PV Shim is going to expose all the PV hypercores into the PV guest kernel. The PV guest kernel then can make the PV hypercore. Uh, so some hypercores can be handled directly by the PV shim, for example, for the PV guest table update hypercores. The PV shim would just, I mean, just use the native instructions to, to, do, to do so. And then some hypercores can go stra straight through into the real Zen. Uh, for example, or s at least some of the event channel hypercores, I like notify this event channel, but the shim doesn't actually need to do anything, just pass that port to the real Zen, and the real Zen will handle it. And then some other hypercores may need translation. So off the top of my head, I think one example is the uh, increase, decrease memory restoration hypercore. The shim needs to translate 
the argument from the PV address space to the PVH address space. So that's one example I can think of, but yeah. Uh, so from Sen's point of view, this guest is just yet another PVH guest because it only makes PVH hypercores. But from the guest's point of view, it's running on a PV Zen because it's running in ring one, it's using all the PV hypercore interfaces. Okay, so here's the game plan. It's still rather early, and I haven't really spent much time thinking about every details because it's currently blocked by the first project, but I do have a rough plan. So the first step is obviously to build a PV shim. So I don't want to re I mean, rewrite a lot of code. So I'm, I'm going to just build this, this as a stripped down version of Zen hypervisor. Basically, I would need to go through all the PV hypercore handlers and then categorize them into the aforementioned groups, these three groups. And then some more refactoring is needed. I would need to refactor the PV guest supporting code to provide the real PV handlers and the PV shim handler while sharing as much code as possible. And the final thing is to change the build system to pull in the right objects to assemble the final shim. And then the next thing to do is to adjust the Zen two stack. So basically it's just to construct a PVH guest using the PV shim as the firmware. This is probably the, mo the easiest thing to do com uh, when compared to all the other things in the pipeline. And then there are some further improvements, but they are actually open questions at the moment. Uh, so whether we should or how to pass the guest kernel inside the container Maybe we, like, we need something like PV grub. And the other question is how to provide the PCI path through mechanism to such guests. But to be honest, I'm not quite sure if it would, if it would still be relevant at that point. But we will cross the bridge when we get there. So the current status. Uh, so I've been doing the coerced grain refactoring in the past few months. Uh, the DOM0 builder is split into different guest types in the last release cycle. So, and then during this release cycle, uh, I've done the domain handling code and the trap handling code. Um, currently reworking my patch series to refactor the memory, memory management code. Uh, uh, it's rather complex, so it would take some time, and then I'll do the rest. Uh, I'd like to provide an ETA, but um, unfortunately, there isn't really one, because it's a lot of work, and uh, the progress also depends much on how much bandwidth all the maintainers have. And as far as I can tell, everybody is rather busy at the moment. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Any, I think that's everything I need to talk about. So any questions? <laughs> Yes, uh, I wasn't already clear that uh, um, to to have a PBH, do we need both, you know, the PB support and HBM, or just HBM support, the configuration, kconfig? Uh, we are only, I mean, as, at least the plan now is to have only two. One is conf PV, the other is conf HBM, because Zen doesn't distinguish HVM and PVH. 
the distinction is mostly made for the convenience of end users. Okay. Yeah. So the answer is? Yeah, so that, it just to require a common code plus HBM code, right? Uh, let me go back. Common code will be always there, right? So if we configure just HBM code, then yeah, you, get, so if, you get the PBH as well, then you can support PB as well. That's kind of plan. Okay. Yeah, sort of. Okay. So that means uh, we can have a s even smaller than that can support existing PB as well. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that's what the second project is about, to okay. move that into a PBH container. The, yeah, the issue is that the whole, you know, like this, this whole PBH v1, v2 thing, actually PBH v2 or the new incarnation is actually HVM. But we, because we kind of came up with a PVH name and talked everyone, about, talked to everyone about it, and you know, yeah, we can't we go back in time and do everything <laughs> to confuse people. So whatever we do, we're gonna, you know, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna have a communications problem, right? We could have a discussion about how we want to name it, but I think the PVH label now is stuck, so. So to, to what degree, so like in, in this slide, can you move, can you move to the next slide? Next. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th th there's a bunch of, some of the code is like this because you actually have to do one thing that just has little bits that are specific to PV or HVM. And if you put them in two completely separate functions, you're gonna have a lot of duplication. Uh, is, uh, it, is, is, is it your plan or, or to, to, to what degree, I mean? There, there, there isn't going to be duplication because the, uh, Say, this function, oh, sorry. We, we say we're going to move all the HVM specific code into this function and PV code into this function. I don't think there's going to be any duplication at all. Or minimal boilerplate stuff. Yeah, I, if there's going to be du duplication, there's going to be common code. Okay, just checking. Uh, you got so in that example, why do you even need the if checks? Like, why don't you, uh, you know, when the domain is initialized, have an op structure where you fill in all the function pointers and then you just call the right one, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's one way of doing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we, I mean, Andrew used to make some suggestion. Okay. And Jan maybe has his own op opinion. But I'm not really, I'm not really opinionated in this area. Okay. So, but uh, this is just for the purpose of okay. demonstration. I, I thought as much, thanks. Uh, so currently, uh, in different subsystems of the Zen, they are following different coding uh, styles. Like the Zen hypervisor code has some different styles uh, yeah, compared yeah. to. So is that also part of the, uh, this refactoring that we will align the coding style for all? Uh, uh, yes, yes, to a degree. Okay. <laughs> On the subject of coding style, we have some files that do come straight from Linux, and we definitely do intend to keep those still in Linux style because it means taking patches uh, is easier. So things like the mWait drivers are a perfect example. We literally just import changes straight from Linux. Everything else is a complete mix because there was no diligent review in the past and we we're attempting to unify all of that on the commonly agreed hypervisor style. So we should end up with exactly two styles and hopefully if some of the other plans come to fruition, some uh, easier automation to um, help developers get the right one. Um, I should mention that the PVH container should help a little bit more on the five-level paging hosts because there uh, the PV guests will be exposed to the larger physical address of MFNs. And today's Linux kernel, for example, masks out the high bits of the physical address which will be needed then. So today's kernels won't be able to run in high frames on the five-level paging host. So this will be accomplished by the PVH container for even the 64-bit guests running an old kernel. Okay, yeah, that's good. Do we have any other questions? <laughs>
Uh, then I have one. Um, so, so if we, you know, assuming we get to this point at a reasonable uh, time, right? So it's the intention that we, you know, if we get new hardware features, for example, that at some point we're only going to put them into HVM and PVH and start, you know, doing less for PV, or are we always going to just continue to do both? We just yesterday we decided to do so for PV gas, so five-level paging won't be supported um, at the PV interface. Ah, okay. So it's the answer already. All right. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you.